Well, today our Bible study is on Acts chapter 25, beginning at verse 13. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you watched over St. Paul, you protected him while he was in jail, and you used his time in jail for your glory, for he was able to share the gospel with uh, Roman rulers, as well as to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ to those who would listen. And we know, Lord, that you will use us in our circumstances uh, for your glory as well. So we pray that we may be blessed and stand firm on the faith so that we might also share the love of Jesus with those around us. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we finished reading the section where Paul, um, he had continued to be in prison and when Felix had died, Festus, the new governor in this area, um, didn't know what to do with Paul and so he um, asked the Jewish people, and the, the Jews certainly wanted to have him killed, but um, Festus wasn't a, about to let a person who was a Roman citizen just, you know, be given over to some people who had, you know, an ax to grind. And so as a result, he's kind of just trying to figure out what to do. Uh, you know, it's, you, you can talk, you, you talk about how justice, the, the wheels of justice grind slowly, you know, they very slowly. But, you know, they, they say that they, uh, they grind slowly, but, but fine, right? So, so eventually justice will be meted out. And yet, you know, here sometimes it looks like this is the same thing that happened to Jesus, right? So Jesus was arrested by the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, and then he was turned over to the Romans to be executed. And so that's what they're trying to do here. But because the Roman uh, governors are not going, you know, or Pontius Pilate, it was almost like he was blackmailed into having Jesus crucified, Right? He said, if you, he said, he's a king, and the, the Jew said, if, if you let Jesus go, then you're no friend of Caesar's. And so that was really a threat that, you know, that they would have tattled on Pontius Pilate. So here, the, perhaps the reason why Paul hasn't gotten killed yet is because the Jewish leaders can't blackmail um, Festus like they did with Pontius Pilate. And, and it's interesting, historically, that the reason why Pontius Pilate was so... Um, open to giving in to the, the Jews to have Jesus killed had something to do with the fact that there had been uh, another, uh, other Roman leaders. And in, in the history of, the, of uh, the Roman Empire, it talks about how you know, there was an uprising and that one of the other Roman governors, I can't remember his name specifically, but he had um, betrayed the Caesar. And so the Caesar had him executed. Right? So this, this had happened like just before the time of Jesus. So Pontius Pilate knew that the emperor would not hesitate to execute one of the governors if he thought he was committing treason. So Pontius Pilate was almost like when the, when the Jews said, if you, don't, if you don't kill Jesus, then you're no friend of Caesar's. He, they were, they, this was a real threat because just a couple years before, another governor had been executed. So Pontius Pilate, you know, well, he probably figured, well, if I kill, uh, kill Jesus, it's not going to be as bad as if I let him go and then I go to jail and then get killed. But here Festus doesn't have that type of problem. He, doesn't ha- you know, he, he wants to do what's right. He knows that he has some protocol. If, if Paul is a Roman citizen, then he has to go through the channels. And even though the Jewish people are all complaining, he's trying to figure this out. And so since he appealed to Caesar, he has to send him to Rome. But he can't do that until he figures out what the real charges are. He still doesn't have the charges. Okay, let's look at, um, starting at verse 13. Okay, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. Okay, so uh, you know, this is the type of thing where you, know, you need a little bit of background. Okay, first of all, King Agrippa, this is the son of um, Herod. Uh, let's see, that would be Herod the first. Um, Herod the Agrippa the first. So there was a guy named Herod Agrippa. That's who this is here, Herod Agrippa the second. And his father, Herod Agrippa I, who was ruling in Jerusalem, you know, that would have been the guy who was ruling after, 
uh, just around the time of Jesus, right? So his father was the ruler, the Jewish ruler of Jerusalem, okay? And then when, he, when Herod Agrippa I died, his son, this guy here, King Agrippa, was, um, was only 17, okay? So he was too young, so he couldn't take over. So that happened, I don't know, let's see, I don't know here, this says it happened in 44 AD. So the time that this is occurring is around 60, 60 AD, so, so he would have only, this would only been, what was it, that's like uh, 16 years later. So then, what, 16, that means he would have been 33 now, right? So at this point, King Agrippa, he's now ruling in Jerusalem as the Jewish, uh, um, the, the Romans allowed a Jewish person to, to, um, to rule. He wasn't pure Jewish, right? Because remember how the Herods were... Um, uh, part they were part Jewish and part from the Edomite clan, which was you know down by the Dead Sea. So the Jewish people didn't like him because he was a like kind of a half breed. So here's the this guy is um, uh, about 33 years old now, and his sister's name is Bernice. Okay, his sister was like a, I think it was um, a year older than him. So King Agrippa and his sister Bernice are visiting, <clears throat> and so uh, Felix, I'm sorry, Festus is uh, asking for their advice. Uh, they were pro-Roman, even though they were supposed to be like, you know, from, from the Jewish background and they were ruling the Jewish area, but they, you know, they kind of worked together. So he's asking, maybe he figures, will you have some more um, insights into this guy because he's Jewish after all. Paul's Jewish. You guys have some of Jewish background, so maybe you know what I can say about him. And also part of the reason why they were in town, you know, Caesarea is, um, is a coastal city and it's, it's like right in the middle of, um, of uh, the Mediterranean on the coast of Israel. So like the Tel Aviv is just south of this, and then so this will be a little bit further north. Uh, Caesarea was a, a beautiful coastal city. They had an aqueduct that came from the mountain, so they had fresh water coming down from the hills. They built, you know, the Romans built these aqueducts. They looked like bridges, you know, and, but they had like on the top of it had like a little trough, and the water would just flow through this little trough by gravity, all the way down. So it, this is like a modern city. <clears throat> so uh, I guess Festus, who had just started his, um, his rule here, I, one of the things that I remember reading was the, um, that when, you, when a new governor started, then other rulers would come to visit and pay their respects. Part of it had to do with, with they wanted to, to let him know, well, uh, you know, if you need me, I'm here for you. And, and if, if, you, if I need you, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. So it's kind of like a political thing. They're showing up. It's kind of like, you know, Inauguration Day, like we had like, on Monday. And all the people came to, to see the president. Whether or not, you know, you were voted for the president, that doesn't make any difference. It has to do with, you know, you show up as Inauguration, you want to, uh, you know, get on the good side. So that's what these two guys are doing. Um, King Agrippa, which would be Herod Agrippa II, and Bernice, his sister, are hanging out. I, I, I was reading some background before the class today, and Bernice, she's an, a year older than her brother, but she was married at 13. So she was married very young, had two children, and then, uh, and then her, her husband, um, let's see, uh, he had died, and then she moved in with her brother. So she was living with her brother, and people thought maybe there was an incestual relationship because they were living together for a long time. And so that was probably at the point right here where they're visiting together, but in order to make people believe that she was not having a relationship with her brother. She ended up getting married to another guy, and then, uh, but he ignored her for the rest of their life. I mean, so they, she was married to somebody else, but the marriage was a sham because they never, you know, they didn't really see each other. Uh, so it was kind of a strange relationship. So these two people, you know. Mine says so she married her uncle. <coughs> yeah, the, the first relationship that she had was. But I thought that in, in Oh, what do you call it? When you marry family, you had to right. stop year, thousands of years ago or whatever. Yeah, uh, well, it depends on what society you live in. That's probably true. You know, like in Egypt. Right, in Egypt, well, the... Um, I thought the, right now they didn't they did that. anymore. Well, this, you know, this is 2,000 years ago. And so, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, the, the girl, um, Bernice, when she was 13, she married her uncle, Herod of Chalcis. And she had two sons, and when he yeah. and when he died, then she moved in with her brother, and then people thought they were having a relationship, so she ended up getting married to another guy. Um, I guess it was Emperor Vespasian's son, Titus, and he 
and actually they didn't legally get married. They just, you know, they had a relationship, but he, she, he didn't treat her well. So, you know, you see that there's a, uh, a lot of interaction and it's, it's interesting, you know, it's kind of like a soap opera, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you, you read this and say, well, here the Bible doesn't give us every, all the facts because the people it was written to, the original audience, would have known who these people were, and so they didn't have to give us all these details. But we can look in the historical record of the Roman uh, historians and see what these people did and who they were. So it's, it's interesting that Luke, in the beginning of his, um, of the, the Gospel of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, is tell, told us and told the reader I did a careful um, investigation of all these things. So he gives us all the facts, and, the, and all of these are, um, you're able to uh, uh, prove them in history. Uh, and I think that's an important thing. You know, he doesn't just give us facts for the sake of facts. And this is inspired through the Holy Spirit, and God had, had a purpose for these things to be written down. And part of it has to do with, you know, Festus, He's not necessarily um, against Christianity. He just doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know why these Jewish people are so angry at Paul. And, and so early on, in the, uh, after the Christianity started, the Roman Empire didn't really have a problem. I mean, originally they let the Jewish people worship the way they wanted, and they didn't have any problems with Christians. But what's going to happen is there's going to be a divide between the, the, the Jews and the Christians become separate groups, and the Romans don't necessarily see the difference between the two of them, and then they destroy Jerusalem because of it, and then they end up persecuting Christians even more and more as the decades go on. Okay. Uh, so we're on verse um, 16. So Festus is talking to um, the, the brother and sister. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has faced his accusers and has had an opportunity to defend, to defend himself against their charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of, of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss to... Um, at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesarea. I'm sorry, to send him to Caesar. Send him to Caesar. So he's explaining his uh, circumstance that he, you know, he, he, I guess he was willing to bring him to Jerusalem, but you know, Paul didn't want to do that because he knew that that was like a death sentence. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, he never wanted to just die. He knew that when, he was, when it was time for him to die, that that would be in God's hands. But he wasn't purposely going to go, you know, to his death. Jesus did the same thing, right? Remember, during Jesus' ministry, for he wandered in, in Israel for three years, and his, his disciples would warn him, you know, oh, you can't go back to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you. And so, you know, he would go into Jerusalem, like in the first two years of his ministry, knowing that the time wasn't right for him to die and God wasn't going to let him die. So he would go into Jerusalem even though the disciples said, you know, oh, they'll arrest you and this isn't a good thing. But when, then, when things got even worse, on the third year when he was about to, you know, be sacrificed, they warned, they said, don't go to Jerusalem. And then he, you know, he says, well, this is the reason I was born you know, to, to go to the cross. Uh, Paul, of course, doesn't have, you know, he's not going to sacrifice himself for the world. He's not Jesus. But he does know that God has a purpose for him. And, and so here we have uh, uh, this description uh, from a Roman point of view of what he sees Paul talking about. Notice in verse um, 19 it says, you know, he, he thought that the crimes perhaps that Paul had committed may have been things like starting a riot, Right? or that he was, um, that he was um, maybe lying about some people or, or hurting people's reputations or getting it mixed up with um, you know, a power struggle, like a, pol a political type of thing. That's what I'm sure the Romans were thinking, stuff like that. And he says that he didn't, he wasn't, um, there, were, there were not any charges of crimes that I had expected. In verse 19 he says, instead they had some points of dispute about their own religion. Now the word here for the word religion in, in the Greek is actually the word for superstition. So from the Roman point of view, if you believe in Jesus, 
a man who, who was dead, who came alive, then this is actually a superstition. So that, that's what the Romans are actually saying. They're saying that Paul has this superstitious belief about a dead man who came to life. Now the, the Romans actually had similar things, right? They had the stories of the Roman gods and the Greek gods. You know, they had similar stuff, right? They had like Hercules who goes down to Hades to rescue his, you know, to rescue a woman and then he, you know, that he, he was almost willing to give up his life and he, but he comes back from Hades, which is really saying he came back from the dead. So the, they had stories like this, but they always thought that those was myths. And so if you believe that a real person died and came back, then that's just superstitious. That, so that's what the Romans are saying. These Christians are superstitious. They have silly beliefs, and here they're arguing about stuff that he doesn't know anything about. Um, Paul had given his, um, his witness to the previous governor, Felix. So he had actually, Felix had asked him, and he told him, Jesus was the Son of God, that he died for the sins of the world, and he came back to life, and he rules, and if you trust in him, you'll be saved. So he, he told all that. Now, this guy hasn't actually had a chance to hear Paul speak yet because he just kept him in prison all these years. But, well, this is in the beginning of his, of his rule. So. so he's sharing this with his king and this queen, or Agrippa and Bernice. And, um, and so he's saying you know, that he's, he needs to find out what to say about him going to, to, um, uh, to the uh, Caesar. In verse 22, uh, Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. Now, remember, Herod, this is Herod Agrippa II. His father, Herod Agrippa I, was the guy who, remember when Jesus was brought to trial, that he wanted to see Jesus. And what, did, what happened when Jesus was brought to Herod and he was on trial? Remember, he, he wanted him to do something for him. Do you remember that? He was interested in seeing Jesus do like magic tricks. So that was uh, when Jesus was um, taken before um, before uh, uh, the first Herod. Let's see, I wonder if I can find the verses for that. Um. <clears throat> okay, uh, Luke, let's look at Luke 23, verse 8. Luke 23, verse 8. So uh, this guy's father had this interest in seeing Jesus. And so perhaps, you know, this is the same type of thing. It's, it's, his interest is purely kind of entertainment value, not necessarily because he um, actually, you know, had any belief in, in Jesus or, or here in the case of Paul. Okay. Okay, so Luke 23, verse 8, it, it tells us, um, oh, let me read the verse before this. In verse 6, it says, On hearing this, you know, about Jesus, that he was from Galilee, he says, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he heard, or learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, this would have been, you know, Herod Agrippa the first, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave no answer. So he refused to talk to Herod, Jesus did, because, you know, uh, he knew that Herod had no power over him, and he wasn't about to entertain him. I mean, it wasn't going to do any good. Jesus, what's, I mean, Jesus didn't need to defend himself, because what Jesus was... Um, he was about to go to the cross. I mean, he wasn't going to wiggle out of it. He knew this is the Father's will, so to die was, was um, his purpose. Uh, so talking to Herod was not, was not going to help. So he refuses to talk to Herod, but then Herod's son, the one in, in Acts chapter 25, uh, notice he has the same kind of interest. Oh, I want to see Paul. I want to find out about this guy who, who follows the, um, the, the man who died and supposedly rose again. So... And uh, Festus is, you know, has no problem, you know, saying, okay, we'll bring him out and it'll be a good show. We'll see what happens. Now, I don't know if uh, they had heard, but remember a couple chapters earlier, when Paul was in Jerusalem, 
one of the things that people were doing was that if you touched like a, a, a napkin, people would take the napkin and they would put it on people who were you know, sick and they would become well. So because Paul was a, a person who was sharing the gospel, he was a, an apostle sent by Jesus Christ, the miracles that accompanied his ministry were proof that he was a true apostle, right? He wasn't a fake apostle. He wasn't a false prophet. He was a real prophet because miracles happened in his presence. Now, he didn't go around doing them for show. It, just, it was just a way that was one of the ways that the Bible shows that, this was, um, that these were the ones that Jesus had, um, had sent. Jesus even told his disciples back in John's gospel, he said, you will do even greater things than I. Yeah. yeah. So this is just proof that... Now, maybe Herod Agrippa II had heard about Paul doing miracles. So that's, I'm sure that that's part of the reason why he's interested in seeing him. You know, so bring this guy in. He can heal people. He can do all kinds of tricks. Let's find out what he can do for us. Okay, so in verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officials, uh, officers and leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa... And all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving death. But because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write, uh, write to his majesty about him. Therefore I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. So we see that, you know, this isn't actually, um, it's not an official uh, courtroom setting. You know, Paul has not, he's not on trial yet, and he's just doing his investigation. So this is, was not at the court courthouse. They actually had different buildings for different things. So this would have probably been in like an audience chamber in front of the palace. So in Caesarea, Festus, you know, brings Jesus in and he has the other people. Now, when it says that the other officers of the city, who would these people have been? Uh, well, in some of the readings I was doing, it says that, um, that, that there were five garrisons of um, soldiers stationed in Caesarea. So that would have been, you know, a centurion is a person, a, a commander of a of, um, of hundred men. So they've had five of these. There would have been five officials, five like officers in charge of each of the hundred men underneath them. So just imagine 500 soldiers wandering around the streets of Caesarea, keeping it safe. And so that, they would have had at least the five officers there, Agrippa and Bernice, and then Festus, maybe Festus had a wife. And so they had these officials and then they probably, you know, I don't know if it said that they brought the Jewish officials in. Did, um, it just says high ranking of uh, officers and leading people of the city. So most likely it was, it was all Roman people. And then he, he's mentioning that the Jewish community wanted to have G, uh, Paul killed, but he probably wasn't having any of them in this audience because it was like a private matter. Uh, so, so at least you see he's trying to do what's right. I mean, unlike Pilate, he doesn't have... Paul, um, you know, killed, even though he knew he was innocent, right? Uh, Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, and yet he still had him killed. Paul, at least uh, Festus doesn't want to do that. Okay. And, well, yeah, Pilate, Pilate had left it up to the people. Right, and then he, he blamed them. He said, you know, okay, if you choose, remember he says, I'm going to release somebody for you. I'll release Barat. Barabbas, I'm sorry, Jesus, and, and he, but he gave him a choice, and then they said, we want Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was obviously a murderer, and Jesus was never caught doing any murders or anything, so he thought for sure they would at least release Jesus, and then he would be free. It wouldn't be his fault. He, would, he could let Jesus go, but when the people flip-flopped on him, and then they chose to release a murderer, he was kind of surprised. That's why he washes his hands and says, the blood be on your hands. Uh, you know, but because the buck, the buck has to stop with somebody, you know, you can't blame the people despite the fact that he, you know, gave them the choice. Ultimately, he was the one who was responsible for Jesus' death when it came to the Roman, you know, the Roman rule. And uh, he could have done something about it, but he chose not to. So that, that, that has something to, be, to say against 
you know, standing up for the truth. If your personal interests and safety overcome your ability to stand up for the truth, then you end up doing stuff like Pilate. I mean, he was more afraid of being, um, you know, maybe uh, brought up against charges by, this, um, by the emperor than, than protecting Jesus' rights. But here, Festus, at least, is following um, Roman protocol. He's doing a, a better job than Pontius Pilate did. Uh, you know, and, and it would kind of be, um, it would be embarrassing to send Paul to Rome without having a, a, a charge listed and, you know, saying he's being charged with rioting. Well, that wasn't what the Jews were charging him with. They were charging him with that he was um, breaking um, the, the uh, ceremonial laws and that he had, originally they said that he brought a, a Gentile into the temple but you know that's not that's not what they were actually saying later on. They never actually used that as one of the reasons why he should be killed. Okay, in chapter twenty-six, verse one, then Agrippa said to Paul, "You have permission to speak for yourself." So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Okay, so notice, remember I mentioned how the Agrippa family was um, half Jewish and half from the Edom, or the country of Edom. So because he had a, an understanding of the Jewish laws, he didn't necessarily follow the customs, but he knew about them, so he would be able to explain this from a Jewish perspective, whereas the Romans would say, well, we don't know what you're talking about, you know, what is this thing about, you know, about a sacrifice and the Passover, we don't know, you know. So he, he, and he starts out, you know, this is a very good way to speak to um, people in charge. You, you, um, you let them know that you respect their office, and so, he, you know, he says, I'm fortunate to stand before you, and, and then he asks for the patience to finish his, you know, asking him not to interrupt him before he finishes and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, and this is what Jesus had told P Paul in the beginning of his ministry when he saw him on the road to Damascus. He said, you must learn how much you must suffer for the gospel and that you will bring the gospel before kings and emperors. So he hasn't actually brought it before kings before, but so he talked to governors. So now he's talking to King Agrippa. So in a way, this is the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy to Paul back on the road to Damascus. Now he's talking to a king, and then he's going to be brought to the emperor eventually. So we're almost at the end of the book of Acts, so all these prophecies are being fulfilled. Okay, um, verse 4. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. So, you know, none of the Jewish people could really um, say that they didn't understand what he had been doing. He lived a really, really good Jewish life. Paul was raised by a Jewish family. He went to the best Jewish schools. He became a Pharisee, which was very strict. And he excelled. I mean, he was like one of the top Pharisees. So the fact that they're mad at him has nothing to do with, um, with him personally, but it has to do with the fact that he broke from what they believed to be the truth. So if he's no longer a Pharisee because he believes in Jesus, then that's part of the reason why they're so angry at him. So he's going to give his biography here, a little information about his background. Um, the Jewish people knew it, but maybe uh, King Agrippa didn't. In verse 6, And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. So he's saying the only reason I'm really here is because I believe that God fulfilled his promise to send a Messiah. You know, that Jesus came, and the Jewish yeah. people are saying, well, no, that Jesus can't be the Messiah because, you know, he broke the Sabbath day or whatever they said. Okay, verse 7. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O king, it is because of this hope that, we Jews are, that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So, you know, he's telling us that he didn't believe in Jesus at first. No. Yeah. 
And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Remember how he was standing there when Stephen was, um, was uh, stoned to death? Yeah, so he's telling them, you know, I was just like the Jewish people. I opposed anybody who believed in Jesus. Okay. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another and had them to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. And uh, in my ob obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So yeah, I mean, he didn't just do this in Jerusalem. He went all over the place to try to gather Christians to have them executed. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, so that's the language of um, the Jewish people after the Persian Empire, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So the, the voice that he heard, of course, was the voice of Jesus. What, is, what does that mean? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I don't know. I never could yeah. that Okay, so think about if, you know, in riding a horse, you know, um, uh, or, or um, well, I guess the, the, uh, it's a Greek proverb that talks about useless resistance. If you're kicking against the goads, that's like the, you know, like the, in, in, around the stomach, or like, be, you know, between the stomach and the, um, yeah. and, and the um, lower portions. And if you're kicking against a, against a uh, like on an ox or a horse, you're, you're not going to get the animal to do what you want because you're hurting it, right? So if you're hurting the animal, it's like if someone punched you in the, in the kidney or something like that, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. So it's, Jesus is saying to, to Saul that, you know, by um, trying, thinking that you're doing the right thing, you're actually getting nowhere by arresting and persecuting Christians. Okay, he thought he was serving God, but he actually wasn't. So the whole point is it's, it's, useless, it's a useless um, uh, effort. Verse was that? Yeah, I'm missing that. Oh, uh, verse, that was verse 14. So Jesus is, you know, is uh, uh, telling him, you know, why are you fighting against something that's going to get you nowhere, you know? Okay, in verse 15 it says, Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what, has, what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles, uh, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who, who are sanctified by faith in me. This is probably one of the longest quotes of Jesus outside of the New Testament. You know, most of the time when uh, Jesus is quoted, it's just like a sentence. Here, Paul is giving us more information because back in Acts chapter 9, when you know, Paul had, saw Jesus on the road, um, uh, the road to Damascus. It was just a very short description. But here Paul is, is telling us in his own words what happened, and he's telling us more about what Jesus actually said. So not only was Jesus going to, you know, send him to the Gentiles, but what other things do we learn about his mission from well, Jesus? Well, not only that, but this is, this is firsthand experience. This right. is coming straight from the mouth of Paul himself. That's right. So he should know what happened. Yeah, and and so you can see that Luke, who you know, when we were like in the middle of the book of Acts, it's you know, it changed from uh, um, from uh, third person to to first person plural, where he was saying we. So we know that Paul, I'm sorry, Luke, Luke was with Paul when he spoke these things. He most likely um, heard it firsthand, and so maybe he wrote it down. So here he's giving us the words of Paul about his experience with Jesus. And that, that, that happened, you know, probably 20 years earlier. Uh, but here, he, he tells us a little bit more. He talks about how Jesus tells him that he was appointed to be a servant, to be a witness of the things that he has seen of Jesus. And also, he says, and the things I will show you. What kinds of things is Jesus going to show Paul in his ministry? He showed, 
He showed visions, right? Yeah. He one time when he, you know, he was stoned to death and he almost he almost died. He says he went up to heaven. And he saw he saw heaven, but he says it was too amazing, and he saw things that he couldn't describe, right? So Paul saw heaven. He also um, remember when he was going from city to city, the Holy Spirit would reveal to him whether he should go to a city or not, because. You know, they because yeah. they, people were trying to kill him. Kind of revelation to what, what to, you know. where to go, what time, and can stop and don't do this and that. That was a, that was a great yeah. ministry. So the Holy Spirit led, led him, and so, he, you know, he's just giving us a little insight into how he did his missions. This is the, mm -hmm. the his, his arrest and is here is after his third mission. So most of his missions are all finished. The only mission that Paul has left is to write the, the, um, the letters of the New Testament while he was in jail. His first imprisonment is, you know, was over two years, and so he probably wrote some of the letters of the New Testament at, during this period of time. But next, soon he's gonna in the the book of Acts he's gonna go to to Rome and he'll be imprisoned in Rome and he'll have to wait in Rome for two more years before the emperor will see him because you know the emperor he works at his own pace and he doesn't have time to see prisoners all the time. So, um, so but in those is in his imprisonment. If he was never in prison, just imagine, we probably wouldn't have the New Testament, right? If Paul never went to jail, he never would have written these letters. So we have a lot of letters because of this. It was part of God's plan. Uh, and also the point is that God wanted to, to save the Gentiles. See, the Jewish people, they believed that they were God's special people, and that's true. You know, if you look back in uh, Genesis 12, the promise that God made to Abraham is that it says, I will bless you and you will have many descendants, and he says, and all people will be blessed through you. So the fact is that God was going to bless Abraham's family, but everybody in the world would be blessed through Abraham's family as well. So when Jesus came, that's, that's how it was supposed to be, that Jesus was the savior of the whole world, not just the Jewish people. And so God was using Paul to bring about the salvation of the Gentiles. And notice what he says about them. He said, Jesus tells Paul, I am sending you to them, to the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. So there, there are several things that Paul is, was trying to do. He was trying to show, you know, show the Gentiles that, that they were living in, in darkness, okay? To open their eyes. The Gentiles are any of you that's not Jewish. Very good, that's right. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's non-Jewish. Somebody asked me that the other day and I told them that I didn't know if I was right. Yeah. And so it, notice that a person who was non-Jewish, if they didn't know anything about Jesus, then they were actually living under the power of Satan. So people who don't know who Jesus is or don't trust in Jesus are under the power of the devil. It doesn't mean that the devil possesses a person who's not a non-believer. It simply means that, that the devil has control because you're under, you know, you're a slave to sin, right? You sin, you're a slave to sin. And so the only way to, to be free from that slavery of sin is to come to know Jesus. So, so that's, you know, his, his mission is to bring people in from, out of the darkness into the light, to know, to know who Jesus is. And the only way that can happen is if you realize that you're a sinner and you confess those sins and you ask for forgiveness. And so that's the goal. He tells, tells us that, um, that he was preaching the gospel so the people would be rescued from the devil and then they would have the forgiveness of their sins. And so this is the type of thing he's, he's telling this. Just imagine if the, you know, these Roman emperors who are li or these Roman rulers who are listening to it may, have, may be thinking to themselves, you know, oh, I know I've done some bad things. I want to be free from those sins. I want to be forgiven. So you know, the Holy Spirit will work through Paul's words to try to win even these Roman emperors or governors to salvation. So that's what's going to happen uh, in verse uh, 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was... I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen that the Christ, that is the Messiah, would suffer and, all, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Paul is 
um, explaining that, that the Jewish people have the same hope that he had, and he wasn't actually doing anything wrong. You know, when he met Jesus on the road, he, Jesus gave him a command, and he had to follow that, that command. It, you know, he couldn't go from it. And he's saying, then I, I did that. I went to Jerusalem, I went to Damascus, and he preached, and he, and he tells us he preached to Jewish people first, because, you know, he wasn't going to exclude them. But he also preached to the Gentiles. And the whole point was that if you turn to God and you repent of your sin, that you, you know, you'll be forgiven. But it, it, can't, it can't just be going through the motions, right? If a person says, well, I believe in Jesus, but they don't have any deeds that show that they're followers of Jesus, then that wouldn't be any good, right? I mean, what kind of religion is that? You don't want people to just join a church. You want people's lives to be changed by Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. So, so Paul was you know, doing it the right way. He wasn't just trying to build up a, a movement. He was trying to bring people into God's kingdom. And, uh, and so they, their claim is that, um, you know, it says he was uh, in the temple courts and they tried to kill him because they didn't like what he was saying. You know, didn't like he was preaching about the resurrection. He didn't, they didn't like that he was preaching about Jesus. And, uh, and he kind of concludes this section by saying that, you know, I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. So if you want to know that who, if Jesus is really the Messiah, he's telling them, just look in the Old Testament. Look at what Moses said. You know, Moses said, like in Deuteronomy, he said, um, wait for the prophet greater than me whom you must listen to. So the Jewish people were always waiting for a prophet like Moses, but who would be greater than Moses. Well, who's, yeah, who's greater than Moses? Well, Moses went up to Mount Sinai and brought down the law. Jesus went up Mount Calvary and brought the gospel. So one of them brings death. If you don't do these things, you will die the law, and then Jesus brought us life. If you trust in me, you, even though you die, yet you shall live. So I mean, if Jesus is greater than Moses in every way. You know, Moses um, you know, was a sinner. Jesus never sinned a day in his life. Uh, Moses you know, uh, argues with God. Jesus does the will of God. You know, Moses uh, led the people out of a temporary slavery in Egypt, and Jesus brings us to an eternal freedom from slavery to sin. So in every way, they're comparable, but Jesus is greater than Moses. Amen. So he is the fulfillment of what Moses was talking about. Uh, and that's the way Paul argued. He never, you know, the New Testament hadn't been written yet at the time that this is t taking place. So the, uh, when he says that Jesus is, um, fulfilled the prophets, then all he had to do is look in what they had already. The Bible that they had used all these years was coming true for them. Okay, verse 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. <clears throat> So, okay, so now Festus, because he's Roman, he thinks that the things that he's talking about, they sound crazy. You know, Paul, when he says that you, your, your great learning is driving you insane, what he's accusing him of is that he's, he spent so much time reading the prophecies of the books that he became like a, like a monk, you know, that all he cared about was trying to find somebody who would fulfill these prophecies. Kind of like, you know, you find people who are interested in trying to figure out when is the end of the world, Right? Well, how do you figure that out? Well, you pour through all kinds of books and try to come up with some kind of, of a formula. You know, there was that pastor last year who predicted the end of the world that was going to happen, like, was it May? Remember? Yeah. And then it didn't happen, so he re predicted another, another date. And he had it based on a bunch of passages in Scripture. It didn't work out. And everybody knows that that guy was crazy. So that's what he's saying to Paul. You know, oh, Paul, you're just crazy. You think you know all these things, and your great learning is got, driving you insane. If, if you wouldn't spend so much time in the books, maybe you would know better. You know, so he's, basic, he's saying that he knows you know, that, the, that King, King Fe, or, um, Emperor, Fe, not Emperor, uh, Governor Festus has a, a grasp on reality and Paul has lost all context of reality. Maybe because he'd been in jail too long, maybe because you know, he was a Pharisee and those Pharisees, they just spent all their time reading. Uh, but you know, of course, none of these things are true because um, 
Because what Paul was actually talking about was, was information that was readily available to everybody. And so when he turns to the other guy, King Agrippa, and he says, well, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you're familiar with the prophets. And so um, it's a good thing that Agrippa was there because Festus, who hadn't known the story yet, probably would have just thrown him in jail and said, you know, just get rid of him. And so he makes an appeal to King Agrippa. And notice that he, he doesn't, his question when he says, do you believe the prophets? He, the, there's t- in Greek, there's different ways of asking questions. You can ask a question where the answer is, a, um, where you expect the answer to be yes, and there's a way of asking a, a question where you expect the answer to be no. You know, in, in English, we would say, you don't believe in the prophets, do you? That would be expecting the answer no. But because he says, you, you do believe in the prophets, Right? The answer you expect is yes. So that's what he, the way he's saying it here. And he, and he goes on to say, I know you do. So he, he's saying, you have the same hope that I was raised with, a hope in a Messiah. I know that you've been waiting for the same person I've been waiting for. And he's here. Jesus came and he rose from the dead. Okay, so he's, uh, Paul is hoping that he'll get a chance to preach the gospel to Agrippa. And this, you know, here's the guy who his father um, had seen Jesus, and now, you know, and now he is ruling, and he could make a big difference for Christianity if he could, especially if he became a believer. In verse 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, "Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian?" <laughs> I mean, he he didn't believe in Jesus, but he certainly was a Jewish, maybe not a practicing Jew. Paul replied, "Short time or or long, I pray God." that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. So he kind of, he he, he almost, he reveals his hand. He's letting him know, the reason why I'm talking to you about this is because I absolutely do want you all to become a Christian. And so that that may, you know, make some people angry. Like if you go to, um, to like a, someone invites you over to their house and you start talking to all their guests about, you know, your religion, that might offend them, right? Because, but um, isn't that what Christians should be about? I mean, we don't just keep our religion private. You know, people say you shouldn't talk about politics or religion. Well, that is absolutely a non-Christian way of, dis- of talking. Because if you are a Christian, how can you keep it to yourself? I, maybe keep your politics to yourself. But, keep, but your religion, I mean, we shouldn't necessarily keep it to ourselves. Because if you care about other people, you'll want to speak the truth in love. You, know, you shouldn't beat them over the head with it, right? That, that wouldn't be right. I mean, Jesus never forced anybody to believe in him. He never tried to manipulate people into believing in him. So we shouldn't either. And then Paul certainly is not trying to manipulate anybody. He's just telling the truth. You can listen to him or you can ignore him. And he says, you know, I want everybody to be like me. I persecuted Christians, but now I believe that I was wrong and I know that Jesus is the truth. And I want you to be like me except for the chains, right? You know, he doesn't want anybody to be in jail. And now, of course, we're going to see what happens. It says in verse 30, The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with him. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So they realize that, you know, that this is really an internal matter. The, the Jewish people are, is, you know... Um, Paul is Jewish, and the Jews are having a, a squabble with him, so this is just an internal matter. And he hadn't done anything wrong at all. So it's funny, because he'd been in jail for two years, and finally somebody realizes, oh, he hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, but notice that their, their decision, they, have, they don't say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't say, well, maybe we should ask him more questions because we want to learn more about this. All they simply, they kind of walk away from it and say, you know, okay, Christianity, whatever. You could have been let free, but you, because you appealed to Caesar, you can't go yet. So we kind of learn something about, you know, how do some people react? You know, Jesus gave a parable about the sower with the seed. He talked about how the seed, some of it lands on the, on the uh, path, and, then the, and some of it lands on the rocky ground, some of it lands on good soil. And so, which of those kinds of uh, soil would um, would these uh, rulers be? Probably the rocky. Ground. Yeah, maybe the rocky ground, maybe even the path, because you know it says Jesus said the seed that lands on the path 
It's like hard, compact. And it says the birds come, which is like the devil and his, aim, and his demons, and they steal the word away before it gets a chance to take root. Here are these people, they hear about Jesus, and it never takes root. They simply say, yeah, Christianity, whatever. You could have been free. And they don't take it to heart. Mm-hmm. So it, that's one of the examples of, um, of the different types of soil when the word is cast. So Paul is doing his job, and as long as he does his job, then he's not responsible for how people react. It's, it's really up to them. Uh, and that's our job as Christians. We're not supposed to bend people's backs or you know, twist their arms. You just say, tell them about Jesus, and they can take it or they can leave it. And the Holy Spirit will do the work. And then if they choose to refuse the Holy Spirit, then we can't do anything about that. Okay, so Paul is going to, he's getting ready to go to, um, to Rome. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I don't know if we should start this section because there's a new section here. So uh, maybe we'll just stop here, and then the next week we'll start on chapter 27 about Paul's sailing to Rome.